Hi, I'm Wesley Allison, author of the fantasy series The Sorceress and the Dragon. Today I'd like to do a reading for you from uh, the sixth book in that series, The Sorceress and Her Lovers. Chapter 1, Bongdorf. The sun was low in the sky over Bongdorf, igniting gold fire on the spires of the Kaiserlicher Palast and the tall, thin, single tower of the Kirche and Serer Heiligenmutter. The red and white roofs of the many other buildings were less striking, but no less beautiful. Centibly pulled a wayward blonde curl back behind her ear as she stared out the large window on the twelfth floor of the Kanalgeschaft's hotel, as she often did this time of day. She had been in Bongdorf for a fortnight after six months of touring much of the continent of Sumer. She thought Bongdorf was the most beautiful city that she had ever seen. Smaller than Breck City and much newer, it was laid out with wide streets and broad, lush parks. If it had been anywhere else in the world, she could have seen herself staying there. She swiftly turned and walked down the hallway to the door of the Imperial Suite and opened it, stepped inside. The large parlor was empty, so she continued on into the master bedroom. Reclining on the bed, wearing nothing but his slacks and a white undershirt, was her companion, Kieran Baxter. Retrieving a lit cigarette from the ashtray on the nightstand, he took a long drag and blew out a stream of thick smoke. Dress shopping again? he asked. Yes. She spun around. Does this dress make my bottom look big? Huge. Good. This is the latest thing in ladies' undergarments. It's called a tabletop bustle. I can see why. He took a last puff of the cigarette before mashing it into the ashtray. I could lay out a seven-course meal on your ass. Don't say ass, Santa hissed. It's uncouth. Baxter shrugged and spun his legs off the bed and sat up. He cared little for ladies' fashions. Santa, on the other hand, spent a great deal of time shopping. This particular dress, newly in from Mirsana, had a high collar in front, though it was cut low in the back. Gold trimmed with black brocade, it had puffs of black lace at the wrists. Are we going out tonight? asked Baxter. Of course. We have only four more days. I'd better get dressed then, hadn't I? A sudden loud gop could be heard through the side door. Sent it quickly across the room and opened the door to reveal a large closet. Curled up into a neat circle just inside the door was a dragon. No bigger than a medium-sized dog, the beast was covered with coral-tinted metallic scales. Its long, thin snout was resting upon its forearms. Its long, whip-like tail, tipped with a spade-tipped-shaped barb, was wrapped around its body. Poor baby, said Senta, leaning down and reaching out a hand to the little coral dragon. Did the bad man lock you up in the closet all day? A thin forked tongue quickly licked the woman's fingers, and then suddenly a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth bit down on the fleshy part of her hand. Ouch, you horrible little twonk! You shouldn't say twonk, said Baxter dryly. It's uncouth. And that's why she's been locked up all day. She hasn't been out in forever, said Cinta, pausing to lick the blood off her hand. She has so much pent-up energy. Indeed. Come along, pet, she said, scooping up the dragon into her arms. The little beast allowed itself to be cuddled for just a moment before slithering up her sleeve and taking a spot on her shoulder. The sorceress crossed the room and opened the doors to the balcony. Go on, said Senta. Fly, but be back by morning. The little dragon shot into the sky with so much force it sent her staggering backwards several steps. Once inside again, she shut the doors. Baxter was now in the closet, putting away, putting on a neatly starched white shirt. Senta walked up behind him and snaked her arms around his waist. You do look handsome when you get dressed up. Thank you. He unfastened his pants and tucked in the shirt tail. I worry about letting her out. We've already had two shooting attempts. It seems careless to chance a third. Yes, but both those times they were trying to shoot me, Senta pointed out. I doubt anyone will ever notice her, and I think, don't think a bullet would permanently harm her anyway. I'm much more concerned about her growth. By this age, Bessemer was nearly the size of a pony. Maybe the females are just smaller, or maybe her kind of dragon doesn't grow as big. Maybe, maybe. That's why I've decided to spend tomorrow at the library. I thought we were taking the river cruise tomorrow. He turned around so that she could tie the bow tie he had just wrapped around his neck. You can still go. By myself? I doubt you'll suffer from a lack of female companionship. You wouldn't mind, he asked, if I were to take the cruise with a lovely Fredonian girl? As long as I don't see you, you'll probably both survive, said Senta. 
Just remember, the women here are desperate for you lot. And whose fault is that? It's not mine, said Cinta. Everyone seems to forget that. I had nothing to do with that bit. Now put on your jacket and let's go. Don't you want to see the baby, he asked. Yes, of course. Baxter put on his jacket as he crossed the room and stepped out into the parlor and opened the nursery door. Cinta followed. Bring sie das Kind ins Vosimmer, bitte Fräulein. Two women stepped out into the parlor. Both were quite young. The first was a dark-haired beauty with flashing eyes, dressed in a simple black and brown dress. The other, who carried a sleeping baby wrapped in pink blankets, was blonde and blue-eyed with a colorful floral pattern dress. She looks just precious when she's asleep, doesn't she? said Senta, as she took the child from the blonde. She is precious, said Baxter. You should spend more time with her. She's being well cared for by Miss Lervan and Miss Mueller, and I spend much more time with her than my mother spent with me at this age, I can tell you that. She is good child, said the brunette. And how is your baby, Miss Lervan? He is ein and big boy soon, she replied. Of course he is. That's why you were able to take on my little pet. I count myself very lucky to find a wet nurse here in Bongdorf. Is she sucking? Miss Lervan blushed to be part of such a conversation in front of a man, but Baxter was already heading back to the bedroom to get his shoes. Yeah, she eat good. And are you happy with her progress, Miss Mueller? The blonde stared uncomprehendingly. Das baby is good? Yeah, yeah, the woman assured. Sie weint kam überhaupt. Senta took the cher looked at the cherubic face just visible within the swirl of blankets. A tiny curl of blonde hair swept down just above the closed eyes. A cute little button nose was just set off by the tiny pursed lips. She handed the child back to the nurse. We will be back before nine, she said. For nine. Baxter returned wearing highly polished shoes as the two women retreated to the nursery. The former Navy officer cut quite a figure when he was dressed. Offering scent to his arm, he led her from the suite down the hallway to the elevator. The operator opened the door for them and then threw the switch, sending the tiny conveyance downward. So, what is the venue for this evening? asked Baxter. Just dinner. No opera, no ballet? I'm tired of all that, honestly, said Cinta. How many times can you enjoy chubby Fredonian women acting out fairy tales? The concierge gave me directions to a little place that's supposed to be famous among the locals. Did you order a car? No, it's close enough that we can walk. They strolled along the wide avenue, around the block, to a small building that looked like it could have come right out of one of those fairy tales to which the sorceress had been alluding. It was a small two-story affair with heavy shutters open on either side of the windows and an ornately carved oak door. Baxter pulled open the portal and they entered to find a cozy interior lit primarily by flickering candles. Seven or eight patrons, all of but one of them women, sat at small square tables being served by a pair of buxom blondes in light cotton blouses and green heavy wool skirts. Senta chose a table in the corner and waited until Baxter pulled out her chair. Once they were both seated, one of the blondes appeared beside them. Gute Nacht? Was ist, um, besonderes? Senta tripped over the unfamiliar Fredonian term. You are Brex, ja? Yeah? asked the waitress. I can speak Breck very good. Excellent, said the sorceress. What do you recommend for dinner tonight? We have a good dinner. I bring you cheeses and then chicken soup. It is very good, everyone says. Then I bring you roast beef or the fish you, d you choose, and potatoes, Kasselberg, sauerkraut, and fresh break bread. Of course, for dessert, you have strudel. That sounds perfect, said Baxter. Roast beef for me, and a beer. Yes, the same, said Senta. And then when the waitress had gone, Imagine serving cheese before the meal. They do have some very good cheeses, though. In fact, all the food here is good. I think I've gained five pounds since we've been here. Ten, said Senta. You really are becoming hideous. But don't worry, that's just how I want you. Fat enough that other women will find you unattractive, but not so fat that I find you disgusting. The waitress returned and set down a platter containing at least a dozen small wheels of cheese, which Baxter now stared at as though it was a platter of poisonous snakes. Senta smiled to herself and carved off a piece of one of the creamier varieties and brought it to her mouth. Neither of them finished their meals hungry. After large hunks of roast beef covered in thick brown gravy and creamy seasoned potatoes, they both felt satisfied and sedate. 
Baxter picked up the tall glass of dark beer and sipped it. They're watching you, you know, he said. Turning slightly, Senta could see the two blondes peering out from the kitchen. No, they're not. They're watching you, and with you being so ugly and all. I told you they were desperate. How can you tell? Watch. Senta raised her arm straight out in front of her over the table, palm down. Flipping her hand over, a flame sprang up in her palm. Within two or three seconds, the flame had coalesced into a humanoid figure eight or nine inches tall, which immediately began pirouetting and spinning in a miniature ballet, all without leaving Senta's hand. Baxter wasn't paying attention to the little dancing flame. He had seen the trick before. He was watching the waitresses, who looked so much alike he decided they must actually be twins. They started at the appearance of magic, and their gazes shifted enough for him to realize that they had previously been, in fact, looking at him. Maybe you could take one of them on the river cruise with you. Maybe both, he replied. It seems a shame to break up a set. One of the two girls arrived with plates of strudel, but only came close enough to set them on the table when the magic had abated. You are her, are you not? You are the Draca girl? I am, confirmed Senta. And now you're going to regale me with the story of how your young lover was a soldier who had never done anything to anyone, but was sent to an early grave by my demon mother. The girl needed no reminder of the story. Nobody did. Five years ago, during the war between Brecalon and Fredonia, Senta's mother, Zerfina the Magnificent, had cast a spell. Senta believed the intent of the spell was to eliminate the attacking warriors at Iguanodon Heath, just outside of Port de Chantaine in Bermicia though guessing Zerfina's intentions were always hit and miss propositions. In any case, <clears throat> Zerfina's spell had not only removed the soldiers from Iguanodon Heath, it had blinked out of existence every man in a uniform of the Fredonian Empire anywhere in the world, millions of men who all simply vanished, as did Zerfina herself, never to be seen again. Lover? Manfreund. Nine, said the girl. I had no lover. Mein Vater was a postmaster, and mein older brother, he was a polizist. Mein brother, baby brother, he collected tickets on the trolley. They are all gone now. Bad luck, said Senta, rubbing an index finger over her lower lip. Ja, luck. The waitress turned and rejoined her sister. Let's go, said the sorceress. I don't want dessert. As you wish, said Baxter. He tossed a wad of Fredonian banknotes on the table before getting up and stepping around to pull out Senta's chair. He followed her as she stepped quickly through the restaurant and out the front door. She didn't look back, but he did. The two blondes were still watching them, and he was back to not being sure which of the two brecks they were really watching. Though his legs were longer, he wasn't, and he wasn't encumbered by a bustle dress or a corset, Baxter still had a hard time keeping up with Senta as she strode quickly down the street. You shouldn't let that upset you, he said, as he fell into step beside her. I'm not upset. I'm full. Glad to hear it. If I got upset every time such a situation presented itself, I'd be upset all the time. Suddenly, gunshots rang out in the night. Three quick shots. Two small craters appeared in the building's stonework next to Baxter's head, sending tiny rock chips flying. The third projectile hit a window two feet higher up on the same building. The grass the glass cracked but didn't shatter. I see him, said Baxter, spotting a figure running away into the night. He produced a forty-five caliber revolver from his pocket and started off at a run after the retreating figure. I'll get him. Don't bother, called Senta after him. It's not worth it. He didn't respond and disappeared around the corner, leaving her standing by herself in the halo of the lamplight. She sighed and turned to examine the bullet hole. Three times then, she said. Three times I've been shot at. The noise behind Senta drew her attention. Beneath the flickering light of the next street lamp were two children. They looked to be a boy and a girl of about age eight or nine. The girl was wearing a brown dress and a bonnet, while the boy had on a great coat and a cap. They reminded Senta a little of her friends, Hero and Herzl, as they had been when she had first met them. They, too, were from Fredonia. As she watched, the two ran into the mouth of a nearby alley. Retracing her steps to the opening of the alley, the sorceress looked in. It was completely dark beyond the lamplight. She listened. She couldn't hear the children. She couldn't hear much of anything, really. 
She heard voices in the distance and a steam engine, but neither of them came from the direction of the gaping darkness before her. With no real thought behind her actions, she stepped into the alley. Twenty feet or so into the darkness, she heard a small splash as she stepped into a puddle. Uathanum. A small sphere of cool blue light appeared floating before her. The ugly, moldy brick walls of the buildings on either side of her were illuminated, as were the ugly faces of eight men surrounding her. They were dressed as some kind of laborers, maybe dock workers, she thought. Most of them carried clubs. One, a vicious-looking fellow with a big scar across his nose, was carrying a piece of heavy chain. Oh, my, said Senta. You are an ugly one, aren't you? Your bodyguard is gone, said the man, revealing a brack accent. That is so cute that you think he's my bodyguard. So you're not from around here. Let me guess. Somebody hired you to what? Kill me? Rape me? Why limit ourselves to just one? He grinned. Oh, I do like a man with ambition, she said. Uathanum Regnum. All of the men were suddenly stricken. Several bent over in pain and several others simply dropped to the ground. One screamed out. Others began to cry. Scarnose dropped to his knees and gripped himself around his waist. Senta bent down and looked at him. Where did those children go to, anyway? The man let loose a hideous moan. Senta noticed an open but dark doorway at the back of the alley. A shriek brought her attention back to the writhing figure before her. If this had happened five years ago, I would have felt sorry for the pain you're experiencing now. She ran the palm of her hand across his dirty cheek. Then again, five years from now, I might wipe out your whole family in retribution. Perhaps you should count yourself lucky. Well, maybe lucky isn't the right word. Uathanum. Black strands spread from Senta's fingers through Scarskin's nose. As a new round of screams burst from his lips, the sorceress stood up and walked past him toward the doorway, leaving the man clawing at his own skin as whole chunks of it blackened and sloughed off. Up two steps, she entered the doorway. The shining ball of light, which had remained where it had been created, quickly followed her when she snapped her fingers. Beyond a long hallway was a vast room filled with bodies. Many women and a few men were lying about on the marble-tiled floor. There had to be more than a hundred of them. Some had their heads propped up by pillows, but just as many lay without any attention to comfort. A low moan escaped from the far corner. Here and there, a body twitched. Sinta moved carefully through the spaces between the bodies. Hearing the clink of glass as her foot kicked something, she looked down to see a tiny, empty indigo vial go skittering away. Well, well, she thought aloud. Somebody is getting rich. Suddenly, hands gripped her ankle. Kicking her leg loose, she looked down into the milky eyes of a middle-aged woman. She wants you, the woman hissed. Who wants me? She wants you. She can go to hell, said Senta. The sorceress made her way through the maze of drug addled bodies to a door that led out onto the street. White ophthalmium, the sea spice, was becoming more and more common. It sapped the will of those who became addicted to it. Senta had seen similar dens back in Brack City, though none so large. Made from rare enchanted lotus blossoms and blue fungus from the distant island land of Enclep and whipped together with a relatively potent magic, the drug provided a doorway to a shared fantasy for those who rubbed it into their eyes. The price for these visions was lethargy, depression, and finally the loss of the will to live. Senta stopped outside the door and stared back into the room. She was still there, lost in thought, when Baxter came jogging up to her. I'm sorry you got away. It doesn't matter, said Senta. Are you sure it was a he? Her companion thought for a moment. No, I suppose not. Let's get home. Baxter put his arm around her shoulder and led her back to the hotel. Senta was lost in silent thought as she passed through the lobby and rode up in the elevator. Once back in their suite, she went directly to her boudoir and began removing her dress and complicated undergarments. She had just slipped into a filmy nightgown made of mere sun and silk when Baxter entered, still dressed, carrying a smiling baby. Look at what I found, he said, spinning the child around him. Come look at her new trick. He set the baby on the bed on her stomach and stood back. The little girl, her eyes now bright and wide open, and her mouth smiling, pushed herself up onto her hands and knees. Ta-da! he said with a laugh. 
Senta looked from the child to the man without recognition. She's up on her knees, he explained. Soon she'll be crawling, and then there'll be no keeping up with her. Ah, the sorceress sat on the edge of the bed and picked up the baby, looking into her face. I suppose I should be more impressed. I sent the women home, said Baxter, walking into the other room. The sorceress followed the baby on her hip. Senta will need to eat again. Miss Lorvan left us with a bottle. He took off his coat, hanging it up, then unfastened the cuffs of his shirt. You didn't think that giving the child your name would be confusing? Men do it all the time, she said. Besides, who do you propose I name her after? Your mother? No, that wouldn't do. I doubt anyone will name their child Zerfina ever again. Her father, then. Is that a hint that you would like me to tell you who he is? I don't care who he is. Baxter peeled off his pants and hung them up. Senta placed her daughter down in the center of Baxter's bed and attempted to play peekaboo with her, using a pillow to cover her own face. But the girl rolled over, rising to her hands and knees, and began rocking back and forth. Putting the pillow back in place, the sorceress slid up so that she could lie back upon it. Besides, bastards don't get their father's names. Is that a hint? asked Baxter, stepping out of the closet in his robe. A hint at what? A hint that you would like me to marry you and give your child my name. Don't be stupid. I wouldn't marry you in any case. You're probably far too good for the likes of me, and I am most definitely too good for the likes of you. Baxter lay down on the other side of the bed so that little Senta was between the two of them. With a flourish, he produced his cufflink box, shaking it so that it rattled loudly. The baby's eyes went right to it. She opened them wide in astonishment as her mouth gaped, leaving a long strand of saliva dripping down onto the bed cover. They played with the rattling little box until the child's eyes began to droop. Then her mother scooped her up and sang to her until she was asleep. Baxter stepped into the nursery and returned carrying the cradle, which he set near the foot of the bed. Once little Senta was placed in it, he turned down the room lights and rejoined Senta, the elder, in his bed. That was chapter one of The Sorceress and Her Lovers, book six of the Sorceress and the Dragon series. These books are available in ebook format from Amazon, from Barnes and Noble, Kobo Books, Apple Books, and anywhere else you find quality ebooks. And they are available in paperback from my website at wesleyallison.com. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this reading of the Sorcerer Center Lovers, and thank you very much for your support. Have a good day.